Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, it's lovely to see so many people here, and it's, it's particularly nice to be able to give a kind of a talk to my family that have been so supportive over the years, actually, uh, without ever quite knowing what I do. <laughs> Whether or not they're going to be as supportive after tonight, I don't know, actually. But anyway, we'll see. Um, I first came to Heriot Watt um, about 20 years ago while I was still doing a postdoc in the US. Um, and I came for an interview for a lectureship. Um, Jim Howie was the head of a department at the time, I believe, actually. And uh, I remember sitting on the interview panel, and he asked me a question, well, you know, you're, kind of a, you're doing your postdoc in America. Do you not see your future academic career in the US? And I thought about it and said, well, I think sort of long term, I really see my academic career in England. <laughs> so I don't know why I didn't get the job that year anyway. <laughs> but I did kind of like Harriet Watt a lot. I loved Edinburgh. I loved Scotland. And I kind of applied again two years later. And I've been here ever since. So, it's, um, so I do much, very much like it. So I first wanted to kind of clear up any sort of misapprehension here. So there's been kind of adverts that Kevin Painter is giving a lecture here, actually. Um, but a lot of you may have kind of, if you've done a kind of YouTube or Google sort of search on me, they may have actually been expecting a lecture from So I would like to make this absolutely clear. This is not me. I'm not going to be showing my ability with darts. I'm not going to be talking about my famous 2004 uh, world final defeat against Philip Taylor. Um, so I'm sorry for that if you kind of came here expecting that. I'll give you a chance to kind of leave at this point now if you, if you, if you are kind of disappointed about that. So what I am going to talk about are the kind of the problems that I've been really interested in for the last 20 years. And they all kind of come around a kind of a general idea of how populations become organized. And the very first problem that I kind of started looking at was this problem of embryonic development. You start with a single cell. It goes through lots and lots of rounds of division. And then at a certain point, all of those cells have to differentiate rearrange and assemble into the tissues and the organs, organs of the adult um, organism. So that's what kind of one sort of problem that I've been interested in. And this example, as I say, of how populations become organized. Another problem that I've kind of more recently got into is the question of how animals come together and congregate at particular sites. So these are beluga whales. They've migrated from hundreds of miles away at a certain time of the year to form these large groups. What coordinates those movements? And at kind of a level of populations, how do we kind of form cliques? How, do, how does society structure itself and organize itself into different sort of groupings? So, these are all the kind of questions that I've been very much interested in. How do you organize populations? And I'm going to kind of answer this by looking at kind of four questions. So the first one is, how does a zebra get its stripes? The second one is, how does a turtle find its way home? Thirdly, where will a brain tumor spread? And finally, why do research areas become hot? OK, so I'm got, not going to necessarily answer any of these questions, but those are going to be the questions that I'm going to focus this talk around. And in doing so, I'm going to kind of help, I'm going to hope that I can convince you that the answer to this question is yes. So that's kind of my aim. So what does it say I do? I basically formulate mathematical models. Um, they're basically models of equations. And, you know, I kind of realize this is going to be kind of a bit of a mixed audience. There's going to be some people here that are just mathematicians. They're not going to be happy unless I show wall to wall mathematics. There's another set of people here that are decidedly not mathematicians. They're going to be deeply unhappy if I show wall to wall mathematics. Um, so, 
you know, this is clearly a kind of a divided society. And, you know, fortunately, we're in the age of compromise. And when you've got divided societies, we all find nice compromise solutions. So I should, thought I'd show one slide with lots and lots of mathematics. <laughs> and those are the type of equations that we come up with. And basically, all of these equations, there's a lot of kind of complicated mathematical terminology in there. But basically, what they describe is how populations change and the things that make them do so. And we write down these equations, and then we try and study them, either through pen and paper or through um, numerical simulation. So those are the kind of models that we work on. But let's kind of now kind of illustrate that modeling process a little bit more through a particular um, application. And the first question. So how do hot research areas form? So if you kind of look on a sort of like any of the sort of uh, websites for places that kind of organize conferences, then you kind of see you know, a whole bunch of different sort of um, mathematical conferences, all of which have been taken place in the last few years. And if any of you is outside any of these areas, um, as you read those titles, the only question that will come to you is, what would possess someone to travel from across the world for any of these things? And I, I, I take blame. For, um, I, I, I was an organizer of one of these conferences as well myself. So, you know, yeah. But the point is, of course, these are areas where there's active research going on. People are working on topics that they find interesting. They study them. They come together. And they want to talk to other people about that sort of work. They're hot research areas for the people involved in them. So how can we kind of explain why certain research areas become hot at a particular time? And as I say, what we kind of do is we try and write down equations that basically govern how populations change. So in this case here, kind of my important variable would be the number of academics. So how does the number of academics working in some research area change over time? And very simply, you kind of write down a rate of change equation, and you kind of think about two principal processes. One is a rate of change due to what we call birth or death, and another one is a rate of change due to movement. And birth and death aren't kind of meant to be taken literally. Research birth would, of course, mean new PhD students that are coming into that research area. So that would represent my research birth. birth. Again, death, well, you know, we hope it doesn't kind of mean literally. But of course, research death could, of course, mean academics sort of um, retire after a certain time. Or, of course, they enter senior university management, and they don't get any more time in there. So, you know, so. So kind of took those two things affect the number of academics. But of course, there's also a rate of change due to some sort of movement. People transfer across research fields. They move into slightly different sort of areas. And a long time ago, back in the sort of 18th century, that could often be quite dramatic. Thomas Young, a kind of a, a late, uh, sorry, early 19th century researcher, he kind of did fundamental experiments that showed the wave theory of light. He also did fundamental work that helped decipher the Rosetta Stone. They were able to kind of real polymaths looking at very different areas. But even now, of course, people move their research over time. So what would kind of influence that research movement? Well, you move because you're interested in problems. You want to find what problems are available. But problems are not equally easy, necessarily. You know, certain problems are harder than others. And that's kind of illustrated through this. And this is, again, for the mathematicians here. Two statements here, um, two, two sort of mathematical statements here. And anybody who's a mathematician will recognize that one can be solved in a few seconds. The other one took more than 300 years to solve. They look very similar, but they were very different sort of level of difficulty. So we're not going to have just sort of easy problems. We're going to consider both the availability of easy and hard problems and how that changes over time. And then kind of lies the problem, because clearly you can carry on adding more and more factors and variables that will kind of change, um, which can potentially change how researchers 
choose their area of research. So how do you keep your model simple enough to be studied, but realistic enough to be useful? And that's the real challenge for modeling, is to kind of look at this kind of famous sort of maxim, it's attributed to Einstein, that a model should be as simple as it can be, but no simpler. So, you try to come up with a relatively small set of assumptions that describe, you know, what, the, what your kind of population is doing. So I assume that academics can do just two things. Some people may be surprised, that may be sort of overestimating an ability of an <laughs> academic there, but, you know, we kind of go with that anyway. So they change research and they solve problems. But they can also create problems as well. Um, and by solving problems, you typically create new problems in the process. At the end of the paper, you kind of write some sort of discussion and that stimulates sort of further ideas and problems in the, as well. So that kind of act of solving problems creates new problems. Now the third one, I'm going to eliminate birth and death. I'm going to take my population of academics to be selfish and immortal. So they never supervise PhD students and they never do any university management jobs, basically. That I'm also going to assume that the uh, more academics working in an area implies a faster rate of problem, problem solving. And I'm finally going to assume that my academics are pragmatic. They look at easy, they try and find easy problems to work on. An easy problem means you can quickly write a paper, lots of grants, lots of promotions, and so forth. Okay, so we kind of come up with that sort of set of assumptions and then we kind of plug that into our mathematical model and then we try and analyse its behaviour. And we then kind of typically sort of um, solve this sort of numerically and I'm going to start with a case where, well basically this horizontal axis here, that's my research field such as mathematics and different points along this line represent different research areas. So you could have kind of... A, um, algebraic geometry here, mathematical biology probably quite far away over here or something like that. So kind of that kind of, and we start with no organisation. My academics are uniformly dispersed across the system. There's no clustering into any sort of research groups. And similarly, there's a kind of a uniform number of hard and easy problems and so forth. And we then kind of see what behaviour we get. And what you see is a process of what we call self-organisation. Over t The academics self-organise to form clusters that are working in particular areas. Each of these spikes represents a cluster working in an area. They show dynamics where they kind of merge together with our, other areas. Sometimes they kind of split off and over time they show sort of all different sort of dynamics. Eventually, they solve all of the problems that are out there and the academics start to disperse and you kind of return back to the uniform distribution. So from this relatively simple set of assumptions, you can explain this formation of how hot topics of research arise, just through these sort of interactions between the academics and the problems that they are working on. That was to say, it was more of a kind of a joke model, and it was really, though, to kind of show this sort of phenomena of self-organisation. The academics effectively started from a uniform distribution, and they clustered into groups working on hot topics. And self-organisation is a phenomena that occurs across the animal kingdom. And it's seen in, for example, these flocks of birds that form very complicated patterns in the skies, it's seen in embryonic development, where, as I explained earlier, you start from that single fertilised cell and you kind of then develop that complexity of the adult organism. And to kind of, kind of illustrate this sort of process of embryonic development um, and pattern formation there, let's kind of take our kind of second question and look at pigmentation patterns across the animal kingdom. So when you look across the animal kingdom, you see of a huge variety of pigmentation patterns. But you also see recurring motifs, such as these spots that you get on the leopards or butterflies or peacocks, etc. You also see patterns of stripes, such as on the tiger or the zebra. And this is a sort of a very kind of superficial sort of example of pattern formation, but it's really a process of embryonic organisation. 
because the zebra is born with that striped pattern. So it means at some point during embryonic development, the cells, the, the kind of the pigment cells that give rise to the different colors have to organize themselves in the skin to create that striped pattern. And that makes it effectively a textbook example of what we call morphogenesis, the emergence of shape and form in the embryo. Okay. And this has been a very active area of research in mathematical biology for the last 60, 70 years. And the key, key kind of key trigger that has made this such an interesting area was a very fundamental paper by a kind of slightly surprising person. Um, and they're kind of going to be kind of revealed behind this sort of mosaic in the moment. And it's surprising because the, the, the theory was, some, was someone that was well known for his work in a very different sort of field. And as we kind of pull back here, some people may start to kind of pick out the picture here. So that person was Alan Turing. So Alan Turing probably doesn't need much of an introduction for a lot of people here. He's one of the kind of the most famous British mathematicians of the 20th century. He's very well known for his fundamental work in code breaking and for the development of the digital computer. Of course, not to mention his um, um, terrible treatment by the kind of the government in his far too early sort of death. But Alan Turing, from a mathematical biology perspective, we kind of view him a little bit differently as someone that, like many people in their 20s and 30s, mucked around with computers for a while and then kind of really put his mind to it and came up with a really inspired theory to explain how morphogenesis could occur. And that was published in a paper, The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis, in the early 50s. And it's actually Turing's most cited work. For all of his work in sort of other areas, this is the one that's cited the most. And Turing's model is based on just two principal assumptions. So he, kind of t he assumes that within the embryo, there's certain chemicals, which he called morphogens, and they diffuse through space. And he assumed those morphogens react with each other. And neither of those are at all surprising. We know chemicals diffuse. We know they react with each other. And Turing showed that this, these two assumptions were sufficient for spatial patterns to form, that you could get regions that alternate between high and low morphogen levels. So effectively, if you start with a kind of an almost uniform distribution, this is my kind of chemical distributed across space. At start with, it's just pretty well the same everywhere. And when you solve a kind of a Turing type model, you start to see a pattern forming. You get peaks of high chemical concentration and surrounded by regions of low chemical concentration. Okay. And Turing then suggested that this kind of blueprint from these morphogens could then subsequently tell cells to differentiate in different ways. And that could generate the structure and the pattern of the embryo. OK. And the kind of why this was such an inspired theory, it was, it was a completely simple model. It just relied reaction and diffusion of chemicals. And it was the counterintuitive insight that it was through adding diffusion that you could create patterning. Usually, diffusion describes a spread of ideas, a spread of information. Turing showed that that diffusion could drive patterning and spatial organization. And it's a very counterintuitive way of thinking about it. Okay. And Turing's model, it's had a kind of a, a varied, sort of create, uh, varied sort of history in terms of um, um, over the years. But now it's very, very widely recognized as being an important um, mechanism for generating pattern in biological systems. And it's compelling just for its ability to replicate real world patterns. So if you kind of take some of these kind of beautiful patterns that you see across nature and you solve them in a quite Turing sort of model, you can get really quite a phenomenal degree of um, correspondence between the Turing model and the real system. So it's compelling for that reason alone. It's also been demonstrated in real world chemical reactions, such as this 
seen a chemical reaction here. This is a chemical reaction that form these Turing-type patterns. And now, with our kind of understanding of molecular biology, it's also recognized that it's probably controlling certain amount, certain processes of embryonic development, such as the reason why certain organs appear on the left side of the body and others appear on the right side of the body. Similarly, it's been suggested to kind of control the position of skeletal elements. And as this slightly unflattering portrait of myself taken by my son Niccolo shows, the position of the hairs that kind of come out of her skin. They emerge from roughly equidistributed points in the skin. So it's a very good model, and it's a powerful model for explaining how pattern formation can arise. And when you've got a good model like that, you can start to make predictions. And one of the predictions that we have um, looked at, at is to do with feather regulation. So Turing's mechanism, there's strong, there's, a, there's kind of strong sort of evidence that it controls the positioning of where feathers emerge on birds. So basically, you know, each of those would come from certain feather buds, and they're arranged in a periodic pattern like this. So there's good evidence that a Turing pattern is controlling that. Now, what's not kind of obvious about a lot of birds, and particularly such as chickens as these um, um, here, is that they actually have different densities of feathers in different parts of the body. So actually, there's a lower density of feathers up here on the neck compared to the body. And it's an example of what we call a cryptic pattern, because it's not obvious that there's that variation across the body just from looking at it um, as such. Now, we can kind of do, kind of, we can test how our kind of Turing model changes as we change key parameters in it. So as we shift a parameter, we can, we can kind of see what happens to the system. And as you change certain parameters, the spacing of my kind of potential buds changes as we kind of simulate that in a Turing model. And that would suggest that my kind of body region would occupy a kind of a region in parameter space here, whereas my neck may, may occupy a point around here. So they would occupy different regions, and that would give rise to different densities of patterns. So that can also, kind of, we can then use that sort of insight to then see what would happen if there was some mutation that kind of completely shifted um, the parameters controlling this. Well, we, would, we could expect that the neck gets shifted to the right, the body gets shifted to the night, to the right as well. The body may get a slightly lower density of feathers, but the neck may lose them entirely. You get a sudden transition there, where you suddenly lose all of the patterning. And that's exactly what you see in what's called the naked neck. It's a naturally occurring a variant of a chicken which has feathers on the body but none on the neck. Okay. So the, and the Turing model predicts that that could be as a result of a, of a kind of mutation that affects where we are sitting in this parameter space. And more generally, this has evolutionary implications because loss of neck feathering is commonly seen across the bird across birds, the ostriches, the marabou storks, etc. And it often confers evolutionary advantages. So the case of the ostrich, it helps thermoregulation. It makes it you know, better able to cope with the strong temperatures. So by having a Turing system that is controlling your feathering, it's very tunable, and that can over evolutionary time courses. OK. So Turing's model, as I say, has been a very powerful way to, um, to, to, to explanation for patterning. But it would be wrong to say it's the only hypothesis out there. And in fact, in other models, cell migration and motility become key elements, you know, as shown by this model here, which describes how cells move. And that can also explain pattern formation. But I'm not going to come on to that, but I'm going to then kind of turn to how these models then that describe cell migration can then be important for just looking at other sort of phenomena. And in particular, when we've got models to describe how cells migrate, we can also then study potentially how cancers grow and evolve. So I'm going to talk now about the kind of the glioblastomas for a few minutes. And these are very malignant cancers that form from the brain glial cells. 
and they're horrible cancers. They've got a terrible prognosis, and the reason for that is the cells that form this cancer are highly migratory. They migrate and infiltrate into the surrounding healthy brain. Okay. So, what do the kind of the clinicians do when they get a diagnosis? Well, they use imaging in order to identify where the tumour is. So it occupies some sort of region here. But they recognise that these cells migrate and invade. So even if that's what you see on the imaging, then there's likely to be some cells out here as well. So they expand that region into a kind of a surrounding region as well. And that's their kind of target region where they're going to apply their therapy. But the problem with gliomas is they spread in a very heterogeneous and complicated way. So that even if you kind of expand that area, then in certain areas you've probably overestimated how much, where to apply your therapy. In other regions you may underestimate and you leave untreated cancer cells. And typically then the glioma grows again from these regions of untreated cells. So we'd like to therefore predict how these cancers grow. And the theory is, is that these cancer cells migrate along the long bundled axons that connect neurons. Our brain has basically got lots and lots of wires connecting different parts to it. And it's a very complex structure, so that creates an incredibly oriented, highly complex anisotropic structure. And if the cells are migrating along these cables, you can clearly see that you could get very complex patterns of invasion. Fortunately, though, we can actually get information on that structure of the brain through a particular type of imaging called DTI imaging. It provides us a representation of this complex structure. So what we do, then, is take this sort of DTI data and feed it into models to predict how a glio glioblastoma will evolve. And when you kind of take that information, then you get complicated heterogeneous patterns of invasion. You see the tumour cells infiltrating in a complex way, and in particular kind of showing sort of very fast invasion where there's a lot of kind of oriented structure. And hopefully that's going to give better predicting uh, models that are better at predicting where the tumour is evolving. And collaborators of mine on this are currently now comparing this predictive power of this model against clinical data. OK, so we take, we've been looking at those problems. But seeing how this is a kind of a kind of five o'clock in the evening, it's an inaugural lecture, we probably don't want to spend too much time on sort of glioblastomas. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an in, insomniac and, um, you know, kind of reading papers about how gliomas evolve and uh, prognosis at sort of eight, nine o'clock in the evening is not really a kind of a good way to kind of get to sleep, actually. So... I was working on this area, and I wanted to find something a little bit lighter to read in the evening. This was about five years ago. Um, um, so I was kind of looking around for other sort of things to sort of study. Um, but that was also the time that Niccolo arrived in my life. And as anybody knows that has a kind of a sort of a young son emerge into your, in, into your life, then all that kind of time you had to kind of um, expand your mind reading, reading kind of science articles and stuff like that and finding new problems to work on, all of the time that I could devote to this sort of research matter completely changed and I had to kind of take my sort of research from other forms of literature basically, <laughs> such as these ones here. Okay, so I've had a kind of a change and shift in where I get my source of information, but... Even if you do, you can still find good problems to work on. Because one of Niccolo's favourite um, TV programmes is The Octonauts. And in this little clip, we're going to see my next topic here. OK, so, so that's The Octonauts. And um, for those of you that you know, are unfortunate enough to never have seen The Octonauts, this is Gruber. He's one of the Vegemals. Um, and he's actually the real deep thinker of the um, Vegemals. He's speaking Vegemalese there. But what he was saying was, how on earth do these turtles find their way home? And it's a phenomenal thing that they do. So let's take the 
a famous site of green turtles. Ascension Island is an island in the middle of the Atlantic. It's about 10 kilometers wide by 10 kilometers deep. And it's the home of the second largest Atlantic green turtle population. And if you go there in the kind of the right sort of months of the year, you'll find on the beaches, well, you, you probably shouldn't because they're kind of highly protected, but there'll be lots of nests laid by the green turtles, about three or 4,000 come up to the beach each year. So these nests, each with about 100 or so eggs. 50 or 60 days later, the little hatchlings will come out of them. They then run as fast as they can to the beach because there's usually nasty crabs or birds up in the sky that are trying to pick them off. And then they disappear into the ocean. And then 25, 30 years or so later, they return as adult females to the beach and they then lay nests, uh, they, they lay clutches of eggs of their own and they actually lay around five or six clutches over the course of the season and then they return every three or four years as adults through the rest of their life. Okay and the reason this is such a phenomenal problem is because Ascension Island is a, is a pinpoint in the middle of the Atlantic. And these turtles travel several thousand kilometers to get there each time they make this journey. So, how do you hit a target that's smaller than the size of Edinburgh, isolated in the middle of the Atlantic, you have to battle ocean currents, you don't have a smartphone, you don't have food en route either, and this is a classic problem of animal navigation. And Charles Darwin cited it in one of his articles um, in the late 19th century. Okay, so what do we know then about the routes that turtles take? Well, before the 20th century, why, where, how animals disappeared and reappeared was often obscure. Aristotle, in his History of Animals, came up with various theories, including migration. One of his kind of more interesting theories was transmutation. So he tried to explain that robins disappeared and red starts appeared at certain times by the idea that the robin would turn into the red start and vice versa. Yeah, that sounds very silly to us nowadays, but of course he had very little information on which to kind of make this. Even in the early 18th century, um, it was thought that maybe swallows and cranes and storks migrated to the moon when they weren't going around. And it wasn't really until the early 19th century that we started to uncover how animals migrate. And a key discovery was the file stalk. And the file stalk is this unfortunate animal here. It's a stalk with, a, with this spear sticking through its neck. Okay. And this stalk was discovered in northern Germany. So they found it alive in the field. Unfortunately, the scientists thought that would look good in a museum, so it didn't live long after that. But they found it alive in, the, in a field in northern Germany. But it had, the spear was from Central Africa. And basically, these stalks were migrating, traveling, across Africa all the way up to northern Europe and the populations in Africa at the time were throwing the spears and in order to capture these for food. This one got one through the neck but it was able to carry on flying, kept flying all the way to Germany with this, this, um, this spear. And this and then similar discoveries led to the understanding of migration routes. Okay, so we started to get a picture of how these animals migrate at that time. Well, nowadays, we don't need to kind of stick spears through um, animals in order to study how they kind of migrate. In the, in the 60s, they were still doing things like sticking helium balloons to turtles and then following them in the boat so that they could follow their migration paths. But nowadays, of course, we've got a lot more detailed information thanks to GPS transmitting. So you can stick... GPS transmitters on turtles and get detailed sort of pictures of their migration paths. You can even stick video cameras onto the backs of the turtles and then kind of follow them as they're kind of moving through the water. And that gives us lots of information to understand how these animals are moving and what they're responding to. Okay. So, 
what did the kind of the what did the kind of the field ecologists do in order to kind of understand the migration routes? Well, basically, they can't yet study the full routes. It's too complicated to do that. But what they can do is find a nesting female on the island. So the females lay five or six clutches of eggs. So you find a nesting one. You attach a GPS transmitter to, to that nesting female. You then put her out a few hundred kilometers away from the island. And then you track her as she attempts to return to the island. And that way, you kind of get information on how these turtles are responding. And we recreate these experiments mathematically. And the connection with the earlier stuff on sort of glioma movement is that we use effectively the same models to do this. You know, we can use the same sort of mathematical techniques to then study these kind of animal migration problems. So what have we done on this so far? Well, what we've kind of looked at is see how effective you are at homing according to kind of typical s swimming speeds and navigation strengths. And one of, the things, one of the things we kind of find from that is because of the very strong ocean currents, um, you're not guaranteed return to the island. So weak swimmers may only be moderately successful in getting back to the island. The homed percentage is fairly small. If you're a strong swimmer, you're actually fairly good at doing that. But for the realistic sort of parameters, we don't expect turtles necessarily to get home. And that could be seen as disturbing for a model, but that's exactly what you see in the data sets. When they do these displacement um, experiments, not all of the islands, uh, turtles, actually get back to Ascension Island. They look for it, but they don't all get there. So navigation is not perfect. And in fact, one turtle got within 25 kilometers of the island, but wasn't able to find it. OK. So one of the things that the model suggests is navigation is not absolutely perfect. We're now looking at which cues are used. Key theories are magnetic field elements and odor plumes, that they're following those back to the island. And we're particularly then looking at the question of whether or not using multiple cues makes you better as, um, as a navigator. And it's unsurprising, the answer. You would expect yes. But what is possibly more surprising is that multimodal homing is much greater than the sum of the parts. Using lots of very weak cues is much better than using one strong cue. And intuitively, that makes makes sense, because even one strong cue can leave blind spots where you may not be able to get home. Okay. And we're kind of taking this further. Let's now kind of sort of sum up. So just to provide four brief answers, how does the zebra get its stripes? Well, Turing's model is a very good one. Yeah, it fits observations and predicts. But as Turing says in the second line of his manuscript, this model is a simplification, an idealization, and a falsification. We always should apply that when it comes to models. They only ever provide a, you know, a kind of an idealization of reality. And there's other models out there. So a key question is, is how can we start to differentiate between these models? Can we predict where a brain tumor can spread? Well, our model, as I say, is seemingly doing quite a good job at generating realistic glioma shapes, but it's still very simple. And a key question for us is, at what point can we be confident enough in these models to start to inform treatment? We have to be pretty sure if we take it into that kind of real-world scenario. How do turtles find their way home? Well. As I say, we found that multiple cues helps to eliminate blind spots. We only studied very short-term relocation studies. How is that full migration path managed? And how, in particular, did the turtles get back after 25 years away? We're no, we're no closer yet to understanding that. And finally, what about academic fields? Well, that was a joke model. We kind of came up with this sort of idea that academics are attracted into areas with problems to solve. And by solving and creating new problems, that entices further, pe further researchers in. It was a self-organization sort of problem there. It was a joke model, but more generally, it was a model that can describe shifting human behavior. 
So a thing that's very interesting to me is whether or not we can use similar techniques to study much more serious sort of phenomena, such as how political extremism can arise in populations according to prevailing thought. So I kind of finish, finish there. I want to say thanks to all of my collaborators over the year, all of my colleagues and everybody that you know, has made su Harriet Watts such a fantastic place to be, students, my families and friends, and for anybody that is disappointed that this was the wrong Kevin Painter, then Kevin Painter is appearing in Face Off 2019 in Derby, and there's still tickets available for that. So thank you for your time.